Hi, everyone. Welcome to Poet to Poet. I'm Rada Markham, and today I have the pleasure of talking to poet Luke Hankins, um, author most recently of the chapbook Testament. Uh, before I introduce you to Luke, I'd like to invite you to become a subscriber of the Poet to Poet newsletter on Substack if you aren't already. Just go to poettopoet.substack.com and subscribe for free. In it, you'll find interviews like this one, plus helpful ideas on writing and publishing books of poetry. So today, again, I'm thrilled to reintroduce you to Luke Hankins. Um, Luke is the author of two full-length poetry collections, Radiant Obstacles and Weak Devotions, as well as most recently, the chapbook Testament, which we will talk about today, which was released by Texas Review Press in 2023. He is also the author of a collection of essays, the work of creation, and a volume of his translations from the French of Stella Vinitsky Radulescu, A Cry in the Snow, and other poems. Hankins is the founder and editor of Auras and Books, a nonprofit literary press focused on the life and spirit from a broad and inclusive range of perspectives. So, Luke, uh, welcome back to Poet to Poet. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me uh, back, actually. It's, it's great to talk with you again. So um, I'd love to start with a question that I get a lot from my students, which is, should I try to publish a chapbook or go for the full length book? So you've done both. And aside from the difference in length, how did you think about these two choices in publishing? And specifically with this chapbook, why did you decide to um, keep the work to that chapbook length? Um, there's no right or wrong answer necessarily, uh, or everyone sort of has to feel out their own answer for themselves, I suppose. Um, I think that my chapbook trajectory, if I can call it that, is a little different than what has, you know, traditionally been the more standard um, pr process of publishing a chapbook as your first ever publication. And then eventually that chapbook likely often ends up as part of your first full length book. Um, that didn't happen for me. Um, I have published two full length books and only now I'm publishing my first chapbook. So that's perhaps a little bit of a different arc um, in, in, ter in terms of publication uh, chronology than than um, than the norm. Um, I think what happened for me was that I, well, for my first two books, I think I had a larger backlog of a lot of work because it took many, many years to get the first book published, which is typical. I think a lot of most folks have experienced that. Um, and so by the time I published, actually published my first collection, I had a significant number of newer poems, uh, so, you know, a, a solid percentage of a second collection. So um, I wasn't really thinking about a chapbook at that point because I had so much material. Um, and then my second book, Radiant Obstacles, came out. I had less of a backlog of material. And I'm a rather slow writer. So I found myself in the position where I was writing slowly, writing new poems. And at some point, I started to feel like they were speaking to one another and that they were doing something together that was a little more than the sum of their parts, if that made sense. So I started thinking, well, what if I thought about this small batch of poems I have as a chapbook rather than like rushing to try to get to a full length, you know, and just get, be patient with myself and my writing process. Um, and that was a really interesting thought. And I was super, um, you know, sort of a little bit excited when I started putting all the, the poems I had together and feeling like there was, you know, that sort of crosstalk between them. Yeah, yeah, that resonates a lot with me, that that sense of, okay, these aren't just a pile of poems, they yeah, are yeah. Actually getting to speak to one another. So I'm curious for you, um, you know, 
were there certain themes that emerged very early? How did how did they start talking to one another? Was it through, you know, their thematic content, the topics, motifs? Um, mm. um I think something I started noticing in my earlier work was, I mean, it's very obviously sort of interior facing work. I've always been that type of person who who is very introspective, I suppose, and asking sort of philosophical and psychological questions and, and addressing my experience of being in the world. And I think over time, I have tried somewhat intentionally to turn the gaze outward more. Not that I think the inward gaze is wrong or needs to be done away with, and it's still absolutely present in, the, in these poems. But um, I think as I've developed as a writer, I've tried to balance the inward gaze and the outward gaze a little more in, in terms of what the poems are doing. So there is sort of a combination of some of my, I guess I'd call them my, you know, longstanding hallmark themes, theological and philosophical musings and questions, right? Um, but also um, looking outward towards some um, uh, social political events and issues that are that are quite current and quite contemporary and implicate a broader, um, you know landscape than just the self um so you know uh, gun violence and um racism and uh um the far-right politics and things like that show up in small ways um or maybe quieter ways in some of these poems but they're present and i started noticing that and feeling like that was um you know, a good balance to some of the poems in the chat book that are, that are almost entirely, you know, introspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's very interesting how um, those, those issues and, and themes that you mentioned, the, the socio-political uh, moments, I guess I would call them, that come into the, the poems feel very much in keeping with that contemplative perspective. Um, and I think that's a real gift that, that we're given in these poems. Um, I'm wondering if you would read a poem that 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 mentions something um, to give listeners a, a little taste of the work. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll, the, poem, the, the chat book opens with a poem called Category Error. And you can tell right from the title, like I'm doing my typical, like, I don't know, thinking about ideas. <laughs> I do, I think, you know, my, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going on a small rabbit trail here, but um, I, I've i always loved ideas in poems uh, and poets who are not afraid to have big ideas and abs even abstractions in their poems, balanced, of course, with the concrete. Um, but um, sometimes, you know, particularly, I think, American poetic, te you know, dogmas and, and, and instruction has leaned too far on the side of, of everything has to be concrete, 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 right? And, uh, you know, get rid of abstraction. Um, I love abstraction when it's done well, when it's compelling, and when it's balanced well with, with the concrete. Anyway, um, this is the first poem, Category Error. Hummingbirds are fighting over the flowers in the garden again because beauty doesn't make anything immune to cruelty. Imagine a world in which each beautiful creature could be trusted. And isn't each creature beautiful? The sleek, streaked coat of the tiger, the iridescent scales of the snake, the shockingly blue eyes, of the shooter on the evening news. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. 
where that poem ends. <laughs> you don't, you know, you just don't see it coming. Um, but, you know, like- Yeah, I, was, I don't know that I saw it coming either. And that's, yeah. that's, that's often when I feel a poem is most successful, where it leads me somewhere um, as if it sort of has a will and an intention of its own. And it makes connections that are probably happening in the subconscious and reveals those to me as the writer. Um, that is, uh, that's, that's the zone you want to be in as a poet, I think. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing feeling. And I think that's one of the things poetry is so good for, um, and speaking more in terms of the experience of the poet rather than the experience of the readers, it's it's interesting. Um, I love reading poems by others that feel that way, and I can imagine that they had a similar experience of discovery uh, in, in the in the composition of the poem. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure exactly where I was going with all that. It just it just occurred to me. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that that perspective. And I'm curious just in, in terms of, you know, to to take this idea of um, you know, the development of the work and the development of the the individual poem towards an ending like that. Um, you know, I think a lot of contemporary poets might feel pressured to, pressured actually, to look at issues of socioeconomic uh, mm. nature because mm. that's that's sort of in our environment right we're we're sort of trained to be uh thinking and looking and 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 you know having having dialogue with you know on a daily basis these these things and yet in the poem it's sort of like you arrive there I don't want to say accidentally because I don't think it's accidental I feel it's very as you said sort of a a, a trail that that ends up you know subconsciously leading to um to right. a moment like that um for you i mean when you did encounter that moment in the poem were you tempted to back away you know were you like oh wait no i didn't mean to go there or or did you recognize it immediately as as fitting within uh the scope of what you want poetry to do yeah, I had a feeling of recognition, like this is this is where the poem was supposed to go. Um, it, it did feel like that. Um, and I think part of this for me is just disposition. I'm not the type of poet who can give myself assignments. Like there are amazing poets out there who write what I don't know, what I might call like project manuscripts, right? Like a, an entire manuscript that is um, you know, poems written intentionally about one topic in the sense of like a historical person or event or say gun violence or say, you know, whatever, whatever, like finely focused topic it is, they're able to write a lot of poems about that intentionally, uh, or at least it seems that way to me. I mean, it'd be surprising if those just happen without, you know, that type of discipline. To, to sort of give yourself that assignment as a project. Um, I'm, I don't produce results or worthwhile results when I try to do that with poetry. Um, so for me, if it's going to happen, it has to happen in that sort of organic way. Um, and I want to be attuned to what's happening in the world. And if I'm successful in doing that and, and, maintaining a sense of empathy for the types of suffering people are experiencing in the world and uh, due to some of these contemporary issues, then um, then those things ought to show up in my poems and it's uh, it feels right when they do. Uh, they don't show up in every poem by any means and I don't think they have to, but I'm glad that they show up where they do um, again, to balance that inward gaze and the outward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are you able to write, like, give yourself sort of 
assignments, topical assignments in terms of writing? Mm. I, this is always a question I get, you know, from from particularly folks who are interested in this idea of of a book, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if themed collections are the thing that, um, you know, the, what's expected, then shouldn't we be all be writing project books? Do you feel that they're expected? Themed? I th I do feel that a book needs themes. It needs to feel like a cohesive whole. And so I'm really interested. Oh, no, totally. Totally. It does. But I mean, in terms of like, you know, a really clear project manuscript. Um, that it's interesting to think about it has become um they've become popular um in a way that i don't think in earlier decades they were so much like you i i look back at say the mid to mid late 20th century and you know a lot of the most famous poets were publishing books that were just sort of a collection of the various poems they'd written right not that they don't have thematic and stylistic connections, but they weren't, um, you know, all in the voice of Abraham Lincoln, or they weren't all, like, I'm thinking of Morris Manning's book, um, uh, or, uh, you know what I mean, does, 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 have you noticed that sort of shift as well? Oh, absolutely, yeah, I mean, particularly, you know, I, I did my MFA, you know, 20, 20 plus years ago now, um, and in those 20 years and watching publishing evolve, it does seem to me that the, you know, the thematic uh, nature of a book has, you know, it's it's sort of the, I want to be careful how I, how I state this, because I think that, that in some ways, you know, this shift to thematic, um, a thematic preference has a lot of integrity to it, right? Like it does make for um, really compelling books in a lot of cases. Um, but I feel that sometimes, and I've heard from other folks who are looking at the publishing landscape, either from within or from at, from without, that that there's this feeling that that the emphasis isn't as much on the individual poems, right? So uh -huh. as you were describing, you know, sort of this earlier era where maybe the emphasis was on every poem being its own standalone gem. Right? Yeah, that's where uh, I land as as a poet. Um, and again, really out of, you know, my inability to do the other thing, right? Not that I'm not you know, saying this is like the superior thing to do is not do project manuscripts, but I just, that I don't, it doesn't work for me. Um, but yeah, I suppose there is that danger if you are writing a um, super thematic collection that, you know, some of the work is there for like sort of logistical purposes, right? Rather than standing really strongly as a poem on its own. Um, yeah, that that definitely can be a danger. Um, another thing that I think has influenced the rise of the project manuscript is that it's so much easier to market. I mean, speaking as a publisher, when a book has a very clear focus, it is so much easier to write book descriptions. It's so much easier to target an audience that might be interested in that topic, right? So I think publicists and, and publishers really like project manuscripts for that reason. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's hard to to sell, uh, a, you know, what do you say? This is a, a, a book of a bunch of different poems that are all really good, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I so to to go back and answer your question. I mean, I I think of it sort of, I sort of split the difference between these ideas of the project book and, you know, I I probably fall a little bit more in that camp of every poem because to me every poem is its own thing, um, but I am very interested in what you were saying earlier about how poems talk to one another and how yeah. they start to develop these little ecosystems. Mm. Um, you know, it's like an ecosystem of, of thought. And so every poem might not look the same. Every poem might not be talking about the same uh, subject matter. It might not have yeah. the same point of view to your, you know, like interior versus exterior. There might be a lot of uh, difference between the poems. And yet there are these ways in which they begin to 
spark, you know, like lines in a poem, like they, they begin to, to sort of spark off of one another. So, so I do start to notice that in the work and to be guided by that, that insight, um, but not to ever have a project, not to ever have a, a sense of, okay, now my assignment is to X, Y, or Z. Yeah, it's so, it's so, uh, interesting. I think it is, um, uh, temperamental, a neurological thing. Um, but uh, I mean, I'm just thinking of when I was in grad school, um, I studied with um, Morris Manning, who I just mentioned a few minutes ago. He, he has a, I think it's his latest book, is entirely in the voice of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, he's always written project manuscripts. And um, in the sense that um, they're so a, a book will be entirely in in a single character's voice, like Bucolics is another one of his that's entirely in one character, one persona's voice. Um, um, almost every one of his his books is sort of a project book in that way. And I remember talking to him in his office one day and asking him about that and how he decides, you know, on what project he wants to do and why he why he writes books that way really and he said I he can't write any other way he has to have a project mm -hmm. uh, so you know people are just very different their processes are very different uh, and that's why I'm always wary of people who try to you know propose like there's this process that everyone should do <laughs> to to be a successful poet uh, I don't think that's true yeah it's so individual yeah, and, and he's one of my favorite poets. And he's just very, his process is just polar opposite of mine, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, ultimately, it is about getting the work out onto the page and and creating a whole thing um, with that. But uh, yeah, maybe, would you like to read a poem that, that in some way talks to the last one you read um, and tell us a little bit about how you feel the poems talk to one another? Yeah. Um, here's one called Synapse. To hypothesize is the luxury of philosophers and poets, a privilege the man in Beirut who tackled the suicide bomber last week did not share when he made the decision to die for those around him. To be or not to be. Synaptically, the quandary lasts milliseconds. In it is no philosophy, only an instinct greater than any poetry. Um, I, I feel like this poem is doing something related to what the first poem I read is doing in a way, but it's also moving in different directions and sort of uh doing some different things so you know the the there's a similar approach of combining the philosophical um and the real world event right and a violent event at that um this one though uh focuses more on the hero who decides to save other people from someone else's violence. And um, that felt like an important thing to acknowledge the um, humanity and heroism embodied in, in, in that event. Um, and the poem also is sort of self-referential in, uh, in a way it talks about philosophers and poets you know it, it talks about poetry explicitly and so it's sort of in a way I feel like it presents me the poet as a, another character and this man who tackled a suicide bomber as uh, another person and you know sometimes I think we can I don't know, poets maybe or maybe I should speak for myself tend to think of what we do as something really noble right uh, so this poem is sort of me taking myself down a notch or two in that way. Like, yes, of course, I think poetry is noble and necessary and, and powerful. But, you know, 
what this man did is is a different level of that and is not about philosophy or or, or poetry um really it's not about even doing something um that it's not about doing something you have a long time to think about it's just his action displayed his character and who he was as a person uh in an immediate way that poetry and philosophy can never do yeah yeah beautiful um and it, it you know it it strikes me as you're talking that the common ingredient you know it's it's empathy um but in order to have empathy there's a sort of humility um that is the the posture of of every poem um so i wonder if if you if you thought about that consciously that that sense of the the point of view being um humble um i think that i thought about the fact that I needed to be more humble as a person and as a writer. And so I wanted to explicitly, in a way, point out my lack in that regard. In other words, like if the poem is humble, I don't want it to be self-congratulatory about that humility if that makes any sense so if the perspective is humble I feel like I hope that in this poem synapse the poem is saying well it's a studied humility it's something that I had to work at right mm -hmm. it's not something as natural to me as it was you know as as this self-sacrifice was natural for this man uh, mm -hmm. in the poem who tackled the suicide bomber so I want the poem to um, enact self-criticism um, more than I want the reader to think uh, wow that perspective is super humble <laughs> if that makes sense yeah no yeah and I I think um, you know what I sensed in that point of view was a really genuine um you know, I I don't want to call it struggle because that maybe makes it too grandiose again. Mm -hmm. But that yeah. sense of of the poem, you know, that I guess engagement, right, is the right mm -hmm. term. That engaging mm -hmm. with, um, you know, sort of consciously, um, deliberately, um, you know, creating poems that have a lot of knowingness to them, but aren't that kind of knowingness that is. Um, so common right now, right? Which is ultimate, like ultimate knowing this. Mm, mm. Yeah, you know, it's it's an impossible position to take in true poetry, I think, because um, the poem won't do its job <laughs> otherwise, right? It won't. Yeah, like like this. Sense. I think this is related to what we were saying at the beginning about uh, the process of discovery. Um, that in I think the most successful poems the the writer themselves goes through um so if you're approaching it with a sort of predetermined agenda um it can it can um you know the poem can become preachy or it can just um feel flat or or whatever any number of pitfalls i think so I, you know for me you know it's super important uh, to encourage when I'm, you know, when I'm teaching um, uh, poets or or talking with other poets, I think it's really important to emphasize the um, the process of discovery and, in a way, letting the poem develop itself and seeing where it takes you. Um, Robert Frost describes a poem as a, a piece of ice melting on a hot stove. And so, you know, what does that ice do? It's, it's, it moves in all sorts of different directions that are organic and happen, you know, naturally due to the melting process, but you can't predict exactly where it's going to move next. I love that image um, uh, for the process of writing a poem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, would you like to read? Maybe one more poem? Yeah, I'll read a sort of different type of poem, I think. Um, this one is 
uh, about my dad and um, set when I was a child. It's called Hum. Though we were poor at touch as a family, my father would blow on my face to cool me in the heat of Louisiana summers upstairs in church where he ran the soundboard. It was the sweetest shock, as if the Holy Ghost had swept straight through me, leaving my spine full of static. His breath hums in me still. I just love that poem so much, <laughs> you know, that that entry. Um, and I mean, we're not seeing it on the page here, but I want to encourage everyone to look at it on the page because the way that you shaped the line and and broke in certain parts really helped to emphasize that sense of um, sort of the tenderness and also the, mm -hmm. um, you know, that relational quality is actually in the lines. Hmm. Well, thank you for that observation. I feel uh, very appreciative of that. I'm always, um, I'm rather obsessive about line breaks, both as a author and as an editor. It's something I think about a lot. Uh, so I appreciate you noticing. Um, yeah, and I think one of the things I discovered in in this poem as I was writing it and as I came to the end was, was this sort of um, um, through line of of electricity. Um, the in the first stanza, the soundboard. He's running the sound at, at church, right? And I would sit up him with him in the booth. Um, and, you know, Louisiana summers are brutally hot and, uh, you know, heat rises. So we were upstairs in the sound booth and it was super hot. Anyway, he ran the sound board. Um, and then the, the sweetest shock of the Holy Ghost <laughs> sweeping through me, leaving my spine full of static. Um, and that begins a sort of metaphorical conflation between the father and the divine. Mm -hmm. so that when we get to the last stanza which is the one the final line one line stanza his breath hums in me still i realized that was both uh god's and my father's um that conflation sort of gets completed there um the humming uh seemed important as the verb to continue that idea of of electricity um and the breath is the dad the humming is the holy ghost and it's, it's a, to me uh, it was an interesting discovery to find that conflation um synthesis of of father and god mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really struck too by the the last word, still, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because the poem is anything but still, right? There's that that reverberating quality, the the ongoingness, right, of that word, still. Mm -hmm. But then there's this suggestion of a stoppage, right? Yeah. Stilling. Mm -hmm. um, so it had this, you know, it's like a paradoxical moment i think mm -hmm. um that felt very powerful to me thank you yeah so if you wouldn't mind because i know folks are so curious about probably about the work that you do with with orison um i'm curious to know you know what so we talked about project books right um what are you seeing in so you, you do at least one book prize plus other books um, mm -hmm. per year. Uh, what are you seeing as far as trends go in the manuscripts that you're receiving for the Orison Prize and for the, the press generally? And is there anything that you wish poets knew before submitting? Well, I think I do see a good number of project manuscripts. And so Orison, you know, we have a sort of a, a, a unique focus on the life of the spirit from all sorts of perspectives, right? We're very, we interpret that very broadly. 
Um, so, so thankfully, we get manuscripts all all sorts, really, um, from things that are very explicitly about like religious or spiritual tradition or experience to things that are, you know, make me think: Is this spiritual? Is it not? What do, What does the word even mean? And it's good. I think it's good to um, ask oneself those questions, or, or for me, as as you know, the editor of the press, to ask that question. Um, and uh, I do see a good number of project manuscripts, say, you know, a book of poems that are all in the voices of characters from the Bible, or, you know, a book of poems that is, um, you know, engaged with the Tao Te Ching, um, or is retelling um, stories of the Hindu gods or whatever, you know, so we definitely do see those types of project manuscripts. And what you said earlier is super important for me whenever I'm reading one of those project manuscripts that is submitted. The, you know, there, there are two main questions for me. A, does the collection work as a project as a whole? But even more importantly for me, does every poem hold its weight and stand in it in some sense stand on its own and have its own effect even though it's connected to all these other poems and it's in the sequence for a reason is it still a strong poem by itself on the page that is always super important for me and i would encourage anyone who's writing you know a kind of project manuscript to be you know very rigorous with yourself and asking that question about each one of the poems um and that brings me to another thing is like I um, see a whole lot of submissions that show promise, but I feel like we're rushed out to submission. Oftentimes I find myself wishing authors would take more time to revise and refine uh, um, the manuscript or, or the individual poems. Um, and that can look like, you know, um, poems may be going going on too long for their own good you know losing their momentum and you know losing the reader's interest or it can look like you know uh the poems aren't you know another organization uh for for the poems would would amplify the collection a lot better or it can look like there are simply too many poems in the book and the weaker ones could be cut you know all those things are are things that i often see mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I imagine it's a lot of work to try to sort through what, you know, are there any qualities of manuscripts where you're like, okay, oh, hey, yeah, this one's definitely going on to the next round of, of re reading. If there's something that on every page that makes me want to keep reading and, you know, that's maybe a really vague way of saying it, but it's really true. And that thing can be anything. I can't predict what it's going to be. Right. But um, yeah, if, if, you know, if there's something on every page that engages my interest, that engages my emotion, um, that impresses on a craft level, then those are the manuscripts to me that, you know, get, get bumped up for serious consideration. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And how we do that as writers is, um, you know, probably a, a million different ways, right? There are infinite number of ways to do it. <laughs> and, and that's one of the really cool things about running a press and being editors, seeing all the huge variety of work uh, and approaches to writing people take. Um, and that's, that's a, a wonderful thing. I think we need the full spectrum of what poetry can be and what it can do. Yes. Yes. Well, <laughs> thank you for all that you do to bring all the voices forward that you are bringing forward in Orison, um, as well as your work, which, uh, you know, I just want to say again, um, for everyone to go and um, check out this book. So in closing, how can folks find you? How can they purchase the book? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, the, the chat book is available on the Texas Review Press website and also through all the usual indie bound um, bookshop.org, Amazon, all the usual things. Um, 
or by order uh, through your local uh, independent bookstore if they don't have it on the shelf. Um, thanks so much for, for asking about that. And um, I'm on social media, mostly Facebook and Instagram. And I also have a website. It's just lukehankins.net because .com was taken. Dang it. <laughs> Who's this other Luke Hankins? Who is this other Luke Hankins? <laughs> is he a poet? Thankfully, not a poet, at least as far as I'm aware. So, no confusion. Well, well, good. Well, Luke, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you.